take the bottom note, actually let's start an octave lower. We take our bottom note and we move it up an octave. So there's our G chord in first inversion, B, D, G. And if we invert it again, we do the same formula. Take the bottom note, bring it up an octave. There's our new shape. There is second inversion, G major. What's going on, everyone? Welcome to Playground Sessions for another live lesson. Today, we're going to be doing something special. We're going to be doing a full live Q&A session, okay? So typically what we do for these lessons is I'll have something prepared where I'll teach you, and then sort of throughout the whole session, we will check in with the comments that are happening live from you guys, and I'll go in and try to answer them. But typically what we've been learning is that we run out of time and there's still comments and questions left over. So what I wanted to do today was play a little bit of catch up, go back and grab some of the good comments and questions from previous lessons and provide some answers today, as well as field any live questions or comments that you guys have in this video today, excuse me. So I would encourage you at any point today to leave a comment and a question, even if I'm answering somebody else's uh, or any of that stuff, okay? So I'm gonna actually give you guys just a minute to write in some comments, and I'm just gonna play a little bit. And in fact, I'd like to start every live lesson moving forward just playing a little bit. This is what it's all about anyways, right? The piano. So leave me any question or comment about anything music related, and I'll see you guys in just a minute. I gotta warm up and play a little bit here. again. Okay, so what I like to do is kick this session off with a question that we saw on a different video in the past. This was from the last few weeks. Uh, this comment comes from Forex Squirrel, and Forex Squirrel writes on my video for uh, the Popular Music Deconstructed series. This was a chord progression video. I believe it was the 145 progression. So Forex Squirrel writes, there are thousands of videos showing us how to use these chords to play songs. But they all show the left hand playing chords uh, while the right hand is playing a melody. What is needed is a tutorial on how to use these four chords to accompany a singer through the whole song. I want to learn accompaniment, not melody. Please show us how a keyboard player would play these songs as part of a band. Okay, this is awesome. So this is a very rich territory that we can get into. And in fact, perhaps I'll do a whole live lesson topic on this in the future. How to accompany using chords. And really what you're getting at, Forex Squirrel, is that you want to be able to play more full two-hand chords, not just a simple one-hand chord and then a, a melody in the right hand. So really the meat of this is going to be about two hand chords, okay? Whether we're accompanying or not, we need to talk about two hand chords. So let me just do a quick one, four, five refresher for you. And this is kind of the way that you're saying we did it for X squirrel, just like root position, left hand chords, one chord in the key of C, four chord, and then five chord. Cool, right? We could jam on that. Add some rhythm. You can also add uh, a little bit of like a broken chord pattern in there. Now we're really playing with some more rhythm. We could also do some inversions.
still just one, four, five, but now we're getting into some more variety. But that's still just one hand, all right? So let's talk about how we can add this right hand. Now, the very most basic way we could do this, of course, would be to double what the left hand is doing. And then you also notice I'm kind of alternating rhythms between the hands when I'm holding out a chord. So here's C, here's F, and then here's G, and I might do this. So that's definitely a good starting point if you're feeling good about the left hand chords. Before you change the way you're voicing your chords uh, to accommodate a two hand voicing, instead, get started by doubling the left hand. And once you can do that, then we can take it a step further. And you can start to decide which of these chord tones we want to keep in the left hand and then which ones we want in the right hand. And let me show you what I mean. A C chord is C, E, G. Right? When we played it with the left hand and the right hand doubling, we were playing C, E, and G with both hands. That's a little bit unnecessary, maybe a little bit redundant. We already have these notes being played. So how can we spread this out a little bit so we're not doubling all of our notes? Well, first of all, the root of the chord typically wants to be in the bottom, down here in the left hand, okay? The third of the chord can kind of be close to our root in range. And when you're this low on the keyboard, it doesn't always sound very good to put a, an interval of a third, C to E, that low. So I might remove the third from my left hand and just play the root and the fifth, which means I'll have the third in my right hand. So here is like sort of the basic next step from doubling your hands is spreading out the chord tones across two hands. So you could do it like this. And if I were to apply that same formula to all of the chords in the 1-4-5 progression, it would sound like this. If I add some rhythm, it might be like this. That's nice, right? It's nice and open. And to call back to your point in your comment about accompanying, accompanying a singer or another melodic instrument, the more stretched out and spread out your voicing is, uh, you know, something like this instead of something like that, the more room your singer or melodic instrument has to play without you getting in their way. Does that make sense? So you want more open voicings when you're accompanying so that the person you're accompanying has a little more room to breathe within that chord. Now, I guess I'm going to leave it there, but what I'll do is, is briefly just preview a little bit of how you could take this two-hand voicing to the next level using some of the things that we did for the single hand in the beginning, such as inversions and other rhythmic type things. And then I'll also go a little bit more advanced and just show you where, where you can take this kind of thing. All right, so here's the 1-4-5 progression in the key of C. I'm not going to be too busy because, remember, we're accompanying somebody else here, so we want to stay out of their way. But here's what's possible. Okay, so something like that. I could be way faster with my right hand, but we have to remember to keep things simple when we're accompanying. So those are the two main points for X Squirrel uh, I want you to take away from this lesson and from this answer. I want you to think about first doubling the chords, then removing some of the chord tones so you have a nice open voicing. And I want you to think about using inversions and arpeggios or broken chords to get it a little fancier but I want you to not get too far down that road so that you're staying out of the way of the person you're accompanying, okay? All right, well, let's keep it moving. I want to check in now and see if we can look at a live question or two. Um, I'm seeing a couple people writing in saying, hey, hey, <laughs> hand emoji. Uh, Andrew's writing, hey, Phil, hey, Andrew. 
Uh, I see Camille Pawanski. Excuse me if I've mispronounced your name. You're saying hey? Hey, Camille. Can you write in a question or a comment for me? I'd be happy to answer it for you. Um, I see one coming in from Andrew who says, why doesn't it sound good to have small intervals in the low register on the keyboard? Does it have something to do with the harmonic series and overtones? <laughs> well, thanks for that question, Andrew. I appreciate the challenge. Uh, I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you the short, uh, the short kind of surface answer on this without getting too heady or scientific about this stuff. But if you want, Andrew, we can chat later offline and, and nerd out a little bit more on that. But really, the go-to answer I have for that, again, it just comes down to intervals. And I like to have a couple of rules, so to speak, uh, about intervals and range. So I like to think about it as a fifth. And that's what I did on the C chord in the beginning here. I like to think about an interval of a fifth if I'm playing from this C all the way down to maybe this C. I could still probably do the fifth down here, depending on the effect I want to have, of course, on the listener, right? I wouldn't want to do that if I'm trying to play something delicate or light or airy, right? But still, as far as the general rule of thumb goes uh, for voicing intervals low on the keyboard, that's just my personal preference. I like to do nothing shorter or smaller than a fifth when I'm down here. And if I want to play lower than this, I'm not really going to do anything smaller than an octave, okay? So if I'm playing like a G chord down here. If I play a fifth from this F, arguably it's going to sound muddy, and maybe even it's going to be difficult to tell what notes I'm even playing if you're, if you're just listening. So think about that, an octave for anything kind of below this area, fifths for anything in here, and then from here up, you can start to incorporate some thirds. I don't think that sounds bad there. But as we bring this chord down, I, to my ears, I think that the third intervals start to sound muddier and muddier. Check it out. Tell me what you think. Sounds kind of heavy and weighty down there. So Andrew, again, just a quick answer for that. I would say keep it to a fifth around here. Keep it to octaves here. As you go up from there, really anything goes, okay? All right, let's check in on another question. I see a couple more coming through. Brent Viverka writes and says, that sounded sweet. Well, thanks, Brent. Uh, I am having fun over here. I'm glad you're digging it. Uh, Mafa1619 says, when is the new PC app coming? Okay, great question. I don't have a date for you, Mafa, but I can tell you that it's definitely going to be soon. We're talking uh, a couple of months or less, okay? We, we do have a lot of work, obviously, that goes into this, and there's a couple of other things on our plate as a company uh, that we have to uh, balance. And so, of course, we know that you guys are looking forward to the new app, and we're working very hard on it. We've actually just hired some new developers. Uh, who are working on our app and working on getting the new version out to you guys. So stay very tuned for that. Uh, thanks for writing in. Uh, David Long says, any exercises to strengthen hands away from a keyboard? Oh, that's a great question, David. Okay, so obviously there's a ton we could do when we're sitting here. The keyboard is built for that. It's like little buttons for your fingers to play and work on strength and independence. So if you're playing anything correctly, uh, you're, you're practicing hand coordination and strength. But away from the keyboard, there are still other things that you can do to, to a degree, to a point, okay? My favorite, and maybe some of you guys watching uh, also do this as well, um, when I'm driving on the steering wheel or on my dashboard or on my knee, I literally practice finger exercises as if I'm at the keyboard. So I'll do stuff like this. And I'll do that on my knee. I don't know if you can see my knee here, but I'll, I'm, when I'm driving, I'm working on that, okay? And I'm working on the same things I'm working on when I do it on the keyboard, which are even timing between my, my finger taps and also relaxed finger and hands. So remember, anything you're practicing, it's going to internalize 
in your muscles. So if you're doing something the wrong way, even if you're in your car, you're going to internalize it that wrong way still when you get back to the keyboard. So even if you're in your car or wherever you are, it's important that you're still working on those same fundamentals, like a relaxed hand and wrist, relaxed fingers. Okay? So definitely you could do that. And then you could also mix up the difficulty of that so you can make it more of a tongue twister for your fingers. Just making something up, but you want to try to do it consistent and then still, as you add challenges to it, still remember to relax and play loose and play even. That's just one thing, but you can get creative, you know. You can draw a keyboard on a piece of paper, you can practice that. Um, you know, you're not going to be able to work on touch or dynamics or anything like that, obviously. But you 100% can work on finger strength and independence, doing all sorts of different stuff. So I encourage you to get creative with that and see what you can do. Let's do one more live question, and then I'm going to get to our next question that I grabbed from a previous video. Okay. Cherny for the win. Mava. Man, that's right. Yeah, that, that would be for the win. I'm not going to pull any churny out right now. VJ Carew says, can you play Hall of Fame right now? Oh, man, remind me how that goes. Uh, you know what? I've taught this song, but it's been so long. That's the best I got with no notice there, uh, VJ. It was something like that. But I'll tell you what, I'm going to make a note to myself to add this to our queue of songs to put in the app if we don't have it already. And if we do have it in the app, I'll make a YouTube tutorial breaking down that riff for you. Uh, it may take a, a couple of weeks. As you know, we got a lot of stuff to produce here in the studio, but that's a great song. And if we don't already have it, I'll add it to the list. Okay, so guys, please keep writing comments and questions in. We're going to keep this thing going, but I'm going to move to our next question that I grabbed from before. And this question comes from Afro83. So thank you for writing in. Afro83 writes, Hi, will you, well, first of all, hi. Will you add any rhythm lessons in the app? Thank you, Afro83, for, for writing that. It's a great question. And I'll tell you that first, you should check out the boot camp. Um, there are, uh, there's a rookie boot camp tour. It's a full curriculum for beginners that teaches you the fundamentals. Then there's the intermediate boot camp tour, and there's the advanced boot camp tour in the app. You may already be familiar with those. But there we cover fundamentals. And in the boot camp tours, we do cover some rhythm stuff. We cover uh, quite a bit, actually. However, there are some topics that we have yet to add. And we have, uh, we're very excited to say that we've just shot some new content with David Sides as the teacher uh, for a new round of new boot camp content. And part of what we're going to include in that new round are additional rhythm lessons. We're going to be talking about uh, counting uh, across different time signatures. Well, we're going to be talking about time signatures, first of all. I don't think we've actually done a full lesson on time signatures yet, so that one's definitely coming. Uh, and then we're going to talk about counting through various different time signatures. We're going to talk about subdivision. And really, that's so, some of the rookie level rhythm stuff that we have been missing. So we're going to introduce that, which will prep you for the existing intermediate and advanced rhythm stuff a little bit better. So I'm so excited about this that I actually want to give you guys just a, a couple of minute little teaser of one of our newest rhythm lessons from David. All right, and if David's watching, by the way, go ahead and give him a hey, give him a wave emoji. David is, uh, is one of the co-founders of Playground Sessions, and he does everything for the company, including teach on camera and a lot of the behind the scenes stuff as well. Um, so I'd like to show you a clip of one of our brand new rhythm lessons. I believe this is a segment from our time signature lesson. And then when we come back, we'll get back to some more live Q&As. Say hey to David.
A typical song is filled with hundreds of notes. I must have played at least 50 there. And when notes interact with one another, they create specific sounds and even different styles of music. Because there are so many different notes in music and so many different rhythms, it's important that we have a way to organize them all. This is where time signatures come into play. A time signature is a musical element that's used to organize all of the notes into small groups, and it tells you which note gets the beat. Now, depending on how these notes are organized or grouped together will determine the feel and the sound of the music. Let's take a look at how time signatures work. A time signature is a fraction that's placed at the beginning of a staff with a number on top and a number on the bottom. Each of these numbers has a specific function. One of the most popular time signatures in music is 4-4. Four, four. So we'll use that time signature as an example to begin understanding how time signatures work. The bottom number in the time signature is the note that gets the beat. When you see a four on the bottom, that tells you that the quarter note gets the beat. How do we know it's a quarter note? Well, remember, a time signature is a fraction. And if you put a one on top of the fraction, you now have one over four or one quarter, thus representing a quarter note. So again, when you see a four in the denominator of the fraction, you know that the quarter note gets the beat. Let's look at another example of a time signature where instead of a four, you have a two in the denominator. When you have a two on the bottom of the fraction, the half note gets the beat. What about when you have an eight on the bottom of the time signature? You guessed it, the eighth note gets the beat. Okay, so we know that the denominator in the time signature tells us which note gets the beat. So what does the top number indicate? The top number in the time signature tells us how many beats are grouped together in measures. Let's take a look. Taking a look again at a 4-4 time signature, the bottom number tells us that a quarter note gets the beat. The top number tells us that we're going to group the equivalent of four quarter notes together in a measure. A measure is the space between two vertical lines called bar lines that organizes these groupings of beats. Let's look at another example, 3-4. In this time signature, again, the quarter note gets the beat because there's a four in the denominator. But the top number tells us that we're going to group the equivalent of three quarter notes in a measure. Now the time signatures we just looked at had a four in the denominator, making the quarter note the beat. Now let's look at some examples with a two in the denominator. Now remember, when a two is in the denominator, a half note gets the beat. Let's take 2-2 two, two for example. With this time signature, a half note gets the beat, and there is the equivalent of two half notes in each measure. When looking at a time signature of 3-2, that means the half note gets the beat, and each measure has the equivalent of three half notes. Now that you have a basic understanding of how time signatures work, it's a great time to practice playing music with different time signatures. Go ahead and give it a shot. Okay, so there's so much more to that lesson and there's a ton more lessons as well, but I hope that gets you guys excited for this new round of content that's coming out into the boot camp uh, very soon. We're just wrapping up editing and we're gonna be shooting even more stuff in the coming weeks. So I promise you guys we're working hard on new content for you. I hope that answers your question. We got a ton new rhythmic content coming. So let's get back to some live questions from you guys, all right? Uh, what I would like to do is check in real quick with VJ Carew. Because VJ, I like your enthusiasm right now. You are chiming in with the most questions. So you win, and I'm gonna hit you with an answer right now. So you really wanna know how to train our ears to play any song all by yourself. This is clearly not something I'm gonna be able to like teach you right now, and then you walk away, and you can do it. It's got to be something that you practice quite a bit. So I hope that doesn't discourage you. But having said that, I can give you some things to practice that will make it easier in the long run. This is one of those things that you just have to try it a million times. Okay? And the way to do it is to pick a song that you already are familiar with of how it's supposed to go. Maybe you've never tried to play it before, but you're aware of how the song goes. Maybe you can even hum along with some of the notes. That's going to be... Uh, the best kind of song to start with, obviously, because you already know how it's supposed to go. And then you really just have to do some trial and error. 
So let's take Hall of Fame for an example. I know I didn't play it right before, but I kind of tried to remember what it sounds like using my ear. And again, I've been doing this for decades, so it's, it, it, does, it does take some, uh, some time and practice. But really, it comes down to this. So you put the, the song on, Hall of Fame, whatever it is, and you isolate one section like that. And you may have to listen to it a few times, and then pick any key. We're going to try to match the note that we picked to, let's say, the first note of that passage. So we have to find this note. And I hit this one. The next step is to determine, is that the note? And if it's not the note, is it too low or is it too high? Da, 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 da. It's too low. So now I'm going to pick a new note and see if I can match it. Da, da. There it is. So that's my note. Da, and then I'm going to do that to the remainder of the notes. Da, 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 da. Is that going up or down? Da, 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 da. It's going down. So we're going to take some more guesses. Da, da, da. That's not it. Da, da, da. There it is. Da, 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 da. So it's not a fun, necessarily a fun or like sexy process here. This is the, the rough, the down and dirty work you got to do on your own. But the more you do that, the more songs you do that with, the shorter amount of time it's going to take you to find the right note. Okay? In other words, you'll have fewer wrong guesses. And eventually, you'll start to do it super quick. Uh, David Sides and I, when we hang out, we like to do that too. And actually, everyone on the Playground Music team, we like to kind of test each other's ears. And, um, you know, if you put a song on, the goal is that pretty much while it's happening in real time, you can start to... So that was how you figure out the melody. What I just did there was also adding some chords. Can't get into too much detail on this, but that's such a rich subject that, again, I think this might, there might be, uh, I think we might need to do a whole live lesson on this topic. That may be in order. Um, but let's see here. Um, I guess let's keep checking in with you guys. What do we got? Camille says, have you considered adding more harmony in right hand in advanced arrangements? Recent additions to the song store don't always sound great with the backing track. It would be great to have a fuller sound. That's a great point, Camille. I mean, to be honest, we talked a little bit about this earlier today in this lesson when someone asked about two-hand voicings for chords instead of a one-hand voicing. So in the rookie arrangements, we do single hands, single notes, excuse me, in both hands. So... That might be how I would do a rookie arrangement of that. Intermediate level, we typically do chords in the left hand, but still single notes in the right. Something like that. In the advanced arrangements, we do add complexity, but more often than not, the complexity is added to the left hand, isn't it? But the right hand still is typically playing melodies. Now, sometimes we'll do octave melodies in the right hand. That definitely helps to fill things out. Okay, excuse my, uh, my mistakes there. But you see that that does add some, some fullness. But what you're getting at with your question here, Camille, is that you want to see actual harmony or full chords in the right hand as well. Now, obviously I'm making this up on the spot, but something like that could sound maybe like this. So, you know, I would need to sit with that to really make it a good arrangement, but you see what I'm doing there on the right hand. Actual harmony, the full chord, this is a C minor chord, and the melody is still on top. 
then you could switch to the next chord. So a good exercise for you, Camille, might be to see if you can play the melody in the right hand and the chords in the right hand. No left hand. Something like that. To answer your question about the arrangements in the song store, we definitely hear your point and there's definitely more complexities that we could add even to our advanced arrangements. But we definitely still want to make sure that our arrangements are accessible to the majority of our users. Now it's a fact that the majority of our subscribers are not at the advanced level. And even the ones who are at the advanced level, advanced doesn't mean you can play anything. They're still like expert level and master. And so it's true we don't have stuff at that level. Uh, maybe if we see more of a demand for that, we'll start to uh, prioritize that a bit more in our arranging. Okay, so thanks for writing in. What I'd like to do now is actually go to one more pre-recorded question. Not pre-recorded, but a, um, a question that was on a different video that I, I didn't get to answer in one of our previous sessions. So this question comes from MyDanBFF. MyDanBFF writes, how much is the monthly subscription? Okay, great question. This is very direct. I could point you to the website and that has all the info for sure. I can tell you just top level, if you, if you sign up for just a monthly subscription, it's actually going to be the most expensive per month, obviously. If you sign up for an annual, the breakdown per month is a bit cheaper. Uh, and we also have a lifetime membership as well. You pay one flat fee and you're in for life. So if you're planning on being for a while, uh, for years, which many of our, our subscribers are lifetime members, uh, then obviously if you break down what you pay per month, the longer you go, it's by far the best value. But if you just get the monthly subscription, you're looking at about $17.99 a month at this time when this lesson was shot. At the annual price, uh, the monthly breaks down to $9.99. Okay, so consider the annual. But really, what I really want to say here is that just specific to YouTube here, we're offering a free trial of our interactive app. You can get a free month, okay, and you're going to actually enjoy all of the benefits that a full paid member has in the app. So you can do a free trial for 30 days with no strings attached. You can click the link that's in this video's description right at the top, and you're going to go to a page where you can enter your name and email, fill out a little bit of info, and then you can start in the app today for free. You can be playing. Okay, and then you can cancel at any time in that 30 day window and you won't have to pay. It's no, that's what no strings attached means. Okay, so I really, uh, my Dan BFF, I appreciate your question. I think you got to try the free trial because you don't have to pay anything. And then when you're done with your 30 day window there, then you can decide, all right, is it worth it for me to go monthly or let's sign up for a year or let's go ahead and sign up for the lifetime. Okay, but take advantage of that free trial. I think you're going to really dig the app. Thanks for writing. Well guys, I think we should kind of start to wrap up here soon, but I want to check back in on the live stream one more time. And I just want to grab another one or two questions here uh, live to wrap up. And you know, maybe I'll start to do this kind of live session periodically too. Maybe every month or so we can do one like this where I pull all the questions that I didn't have time to answer because I really do love you guys writing in and I really want to encourage it, but we're probably not going to get to all the, the comments today. So keep writing them, and if we don't get to them today, you may find that I answer you in a, in a future video. All right, so let's check it out. VJ, thanks for hanging. I'm, I hope that that uh, helped. That's some real work we have to do. You're right, VJ. Like I said, you know, sometimes there's a shortcut or a tip to get you around something. Other times there's not, and you just gotta, you just gotta put in that work. But I promise it's worth it. I can, I can read music, I can sight read, I can improvise, I can make up stuff, by, I can play by ear. Of all the things I can do, I think picking something out by ear is the most rewarding for me. Um, so I would definitely encourage you to put in that time, even though it, it can be kind of a long journey. Just keep practicing and try not to get discouraged, VJ. Um, Terrell Robinson says, awesome. What up, Terrell? Uh, I'm glad you're having a good time. J. Galileo, J. L. Galileo says, hey, Phil. Any chance of getting a wish list added to the song library? Hey, that's a great idea. So actually, right now, we're in the process of building the new app, right? And so we're putting in some of the stuff that we haven't had in the past uh, or the current iteration of the app. Um, 
I don't think wish list is in the app, but I will tell you that we have uh, a, a relatively new song request site uh, that I believe is also linked in this video's description where you can go and request any song that you want us to put in the app. You can also see what other people have requested. Um, and it's essentially like an upvote system where if you want to request something that someone else already requested, you can like add your name to that essentially and it'll bring it up. Um, we also communicate with you guys in the song request form as well and we let you know, oh, this particular song, we don't have the rights to it or this particular song, yada yada. So you can see kind of the status of w the songs that you guys are requesting. So definitely check out the song request site. That can be your wish list for now. And uh, I encourage you to check that out and see what other people are voting on as well. Cool, thanks for writing in. Pradeep, Pradeep Murali writes in, how do we know uh, the BPM or tempo of any song? Um, it depends on where you're checking out the song. If you have a piece of official sheet music, notation, or if you're in the Playground Sessions app, uh, there is a definitive tempo marking. It might say quarter note equals 120, for example. And that tells you that the clicks for our even timing and our tempo are going to be at a 120 beats per minute. And this is not 120 BPM. I'm just, tap I'm just snapping evenly. And it's also going to tell us that the quarter note is what gets the beat, okay? Um, in the Playground app, you instead, you're not going to see it in the notation necessarily, but if you go up to your toolbar at the top of the app, you're going to see a bunch of buttons, and you're going to see a tempo area in the, in the toolbar. You're going to see a preset slow tempo and a preset normal tempo, and those are buttons you can toggle. And it also says the BPM number in those buttons. So our full tempo, you might see 80. And then in the slow tempo button, you might see 50. Um, those are our suggested tempos for practice and for performance. Um, typically, that's where you'll get your info for what's the BPM of this song. However, if you're listening to something on the radio or if you're watching a YouTube video, you may not be able to find that information written down. So you may have to, tr if you really need the exact BPM, if you're listening to a song, you may need to do a little trial and error. Pull up a metronome, okay, you've got one in the Playground app, you also you can get a free metronome app on most, most uh, smartphones, and just see if you can match it evenly. See if you can feel the pulse of the music, and then take a guess on a number on your metronome. And this is actually similar to picking out a melody by ear. You just have to assess and compare. Is that right? Is it too slow? Is it too fast? and then make an adjustment, okay? So good luck with that. Uh, your metronome tool can be really helpful for that kind of stuff. I think we have time for two more quick ones, guys, and then we're gonna get out of here. Um, all right. Ah, VJ, here's another question. Man, you're really coming in with some good ones today. I appreciate it. Is, 61 key, is a 61 key keyboard sufficient to play any pop song? Okay, so this keyboard here is 88 keys and a, uh, any full-size piano or standard full-size keyboard is going to have 88 keys. And then there are models that have fewer keys, 76 I think it is, 60 something, 49. Um, there are a couple of standards as you get shorter. Uh, your question is, can I, play most, can I play any pop song with 61 keys? I will say yes and no. And the asterisk there is about it depends on the arrangement, okay? So we've got a pop song. Let's just say Hall of Fame. That's the theme for today. Okay? Let's say we have that in the app. That's a pop song. The rookie level arrangement is likely going to be able to be played with a very small keyboard, maybe two octaves, okay? Something like this. Um, the intermediate level arrangement, maybe we're going to add a little more range. And the advanced, we're going to add a little more range as well. Some of our advanced songs, you need an 88 key keyboard to play. None of our beginner songs need an 88, keyboard, uh, 88 key keyboard to play. And so then it just depends on the song itself, the arrangement itself, um, what's the highest note, what's the lowest note. Uh, one thing we are working on adding to the app is we're putting that information on each song. So you can quickly see what level is the song, you know, what key is it in, what time signature, things like that. And what, how many keys do I need my keyboard to have to be able to play it? 
So if I'm playing Hall of Fame and I want to go crazy with it, I probably need all 88 keys, you know? <laughs> Whatever. You could do something fun that requires more. Pop songs typically are more repetitive and a bit more simple, so chances are a given pop song, you're going to be able to cover it with 61 keys compared to like a classical song where you may need more. Um, but it just comes down to the arrangement. If you're working at the beginner or intermediate level, you should be good. Advanced, you may need to think about stepping up to 88 keys sooner than later. All right, last question. And again, keep writing them in. If I don't get to them today, uh, we will get to them in a future video. All right, so Daryl Cox. Uh, he has a customer support question. Um, so Daryl, I'm sure that anyone from our customer support team will be happy to help you out, including I see Andrew already wrote, says send him a quick email. Andrew's super quick and so is everybody on our support team. By the way guys, if you didn't know, you got essentially 24-7 support from Playground, okay? We're, we're responding to chats on the weekends sometimes and we're definitely getting back to you very quickly on live chat where there's a real person. We've got people answering phones. Uh, and you may be familiar with some of the people on our support team. Andrew, Maria, Thomas, and David himself will help as well. Our CEO, Chris, as well. We definitely take customer support very seriously. So, Daryl, I promise you're going to get a quick response. And uh, I hope that you're happy with uh, the care that you receive. Guys, let's leave it there. Thanks so much for hanging out for this live Q&A. Uh, I promise the next live lesson we do, we're going to get into a music topic again. I'm going to teach you something new. But... I kind of do like these kind of roundup lessons as well. Maybe we'll mix these in as we go. Before I head out, I just want to give you guys a, a quick update on what's new here at Playground Sessions. We're right in the middle of our current social media challenge. It's a classical themed challenge. So uh, if you don't know, every month or so we do a challenge on Facebook. We encourage our users to uh, record a, a video. It could be very low quality or from your phone or anything. Um, of yourself playing something that we've asked you to play for that month's challenge and you post that video to Facebook and all you have to do is post a video and you're entered for a chance to win. We do prizes for these and I believe the prize for the winner of this month's classical challenge is a one-on-one -on -one lesson with me. So here I'm doing a one-to-many lesson and it's difficult for me to really talk directly to you, the individual, especially if I was going to give you feedback on your performance. You play something and I'll critique it and I'll help you figure out ways that you can get better based on your performance. So I'm excited to fulfill this, this prize and whoever wins, we're going to hang out for a one-on-one -on -one lesson uh, using Skype or some sort, of a, some sort of tech that you've got and we'll work out all those details when we pick the winner. But that's pretty cool, the social challenge. We're going to do another challenge next month, resetting everything, new theme, new prizes, new chances to win. So I wanted to say that. Uh, we're also going to be uh, introducing some new content. I mentioned we've got the new boot camp stuff coming. We've got a Hannon course coming soon, uh, really soon, like a matter of weeks, I promise. Uh, and then we're going to be introducing some new course content as well beyond that for more drills. Uh, more additional scales, exercises, things like that. And then we're going to be shooting more video content with our extended musical family. Our friends at Quincy Jones Productions, uh, like Justin Coughlin, who's a, a jazz pianist. If you tuned into our last live lesson, you maybe saw Justin talking about how he practices. So we've shot a bunch of lesson content with him as well we're going to be introducing. So it's all about new content right now for you guys, including these live lessons, which we're trying really hard to keep doing every week. Let's leave it there, guys. Thanks so much for tuning in. I'm Phil. I'll see you guys for the next live lesson and more. We take the bottom note. Actually, let's start an octave lower. We take our bottom note and we move it up an octave. So there's our G chord in first inversion, B, D, G. And if we invert it again, we do the same formula. Take the bottom note, bring it up an octave. There's our new shape. There is second inversion G major. 